Okay, so it looks like most people are in. So I think I will uh, go ahead and get started. And if there's any late arrivals, uh, they can, can join as well. Um, so good evening to everybody uh, in Vietnam, uh, or if you happen to be like me here in the US, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Greg Friedman. I am the Director of International Admission at the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in the United States, uh, located in Boston. Uh, we also go by the, the shorter name MCPHS University. Uh, so I just first want to say big thanks to, to Kelly from the Counseling Office at SSIS uh, and also the team uh, at Croc uh, for hosting us and for hosting uh, this session today. Uh, and also just a quick note before we get started, uh, there is uh, a Q&A box uh, in your Zoom screen. So if you do have any questions, feel free to list those out throughout the presentation. No need to wait till the end. Um, in case you forget your question, go ahead and list it there. I'll probably wait until the end to answer it, but you can go ahead and list those out at any point. All right, so uh, I, I believe uh, either most or likely all of you that are here today uh, are from the SSIS community. And I know as such, you, know, you guys offer, I, I believe, both a, an IB uh, and uh, an American AP-based curriculum, which should mean that you guys are pretty well prepared to go anywhere for your post-secondary education. However, today's presentation is going to focus exclusively on the United States, uh, where I am located and, and where our university is located. So the, the US has more than 4,000 different colleges and universities, uh, which really makes it the largest higher education system in the world. And what makes it even more unique is that every single one of those colleges and universities has their own individual unique characteristics and in many cases can set their own individual admissions requirements. That makes it fairly different from a lot of other countries, higher education systems around the world, where they tend to be a little bit more unified in the way that you would apply to a college or university in those countries. So a little bit different than the US. And so I say that uh, just so you keep in mind throughout this presentation, everything I'm going to talk about should be considered a representative sample of those 4,000 universities. It's not necessarily going to apply to 100% of cases, though hopefully it should be a fairly good representation of those schools. But just keep that in mind as we go throughout the presentation. Uh, and one other quick note before I really move on, I, I wanna just quickly start by defining the words college and university, because you might actually hear me using these words interchangeably, and that's not, uh, not an accident. I know in many countries, uh, the words college and university have very different, very distinct meanings. In the United States, uh, on a technical level, they also do. But on a practical and a more cultural level, they really pretty much mean the same thing. We use those two words interchangeably all the time. I graduated as an example. I went to the University of Massachusetts. We hear the word university, right? But my friends will ask me, hey, you know, where did you attend college? And I'll still respond by saying UMass, University of Massachusetts. And there's no confusion because we know that we're talking about the same thing, college and university, very interchangeably used. But on a technical level, a college uh, you know, can be a standalone institution or it can be within a larger university. If it's in the latter setting, typically that word would actually have the meaning of department. So for example, in a large university like where I attended, if you, you know, had the, the college of business or the college of engineering, uh, that would simply refer to the Department of Business or the Department of Engineering. Uh, in the United Kingdom, they might call the Faculty of, uh, of uh, Business or the Faculty of Engineering, but same type of meaning. But again, if you hear me using the words interchangeably, that's because that's what we do here uh, in the United States. We, we tend to be fairly unique. Um, all right, so let's uh, kind of talk about some of the different types of, uh, of institutions that exist within the higher education landscape in the United States. Um, you know, in addition to simply having such a large number, uh, another unique factor of the higher education system in the U.S. is really the diversity of the types of institutions that we have. So many different types of institutions. Um, and I know in, in, in some countries, uh, it may be as simple as looking at it, whether a school is public or private to determine the quality. So I know there's several countries, you know, where uh, generally speaking, uh, public universities are, are considered by most people to be the highest quality institutions. Other countries may be private ones are. Um, really not the case either way in the United States. Um, among all the 4,000 different types of colleges and universities uh, and all these different categories I'll talk about in just a moment, there are very high quality ones of each and there are probably lower quality ones of each as well. So you have to do a little bit more digging to find the quality, not quite as simple as just looking at the name or looking whether it's public or private. 
But let's start uh, and, and unpack a few of these. And again, these should represent the majority, but maybe not 100%. Um, a public research university is the first one that I'll start with. Uh, these tend to be the, the largest types of universities um, and most likely are probably what you're thinking of when you picture an American university in your mind, uh, maybe what you would see on American TV shows uh, or, or movies. Um, again, they tend to be the largest and as the name would suggest, they're public, which means that they are going to be uh, funded uh, by the government, usually by a particular state government. Uh, you hear the word research in there as well, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on, but the, the research focus uh, means that that's generally something that their professors and most of their graduate students are fo focusing on. Not necessarily the undergraduate bachelor's students. You might, but that's not necessarily the case. It's usually more geared towards the graduate population of a particular school. Um, you can kind of tell a uh, uh, public research university oftentimes by the name. So again, where I went, University of Massachusetts, so if you follow that same format, University of, and then insert the name of any American state, University of Alabama, University of Florida, University of Missouri, et cetera, those are all going to be public research universities. It's not limited to those. There are other ones with different names other than the state name, but those are the more common and well-known ones. So that's category number one. Uh, number two is what we call liberal arts college. And I'm guessing many of you have probably heard this term before. I know you've got great college counselors, so you've probably heard this term before. Uh, but a liberal arts college, uh, just to kind of define it, is usually a much smaller institution compared to a public research university. And they tend to be private. Uh, there are a few public universities, uh, public liberal arts colleges, but they by and large tend to be private. Uh, another kind of unique characteristics of these schools is they tend to be more undergraduate focused. So they primarily offer bachelor's degrees. They may not be very focused on or may not even offer at all uh, master's degrees or PhD degrees. Um, so much more focused on undergraduate education. Uh, and the, the, the kind of the, the style of their education tends to be a little bit more, we call it well-rounded or you know, blended in the type of the curriculum that they offer. Um, you will take a particular major, just like you would at a public research university, uh, but you'll, you'll kind of have a combination of different classes as well, such as the humanities, the social sciences, the hard sciences as well, in, in that kind of what I, what I would call blended or, or a little more diverse type of a curriculum. Um, and one other thing I, I do want to point out here is I've, I've had this question before and it didn't appear, it occur to me until I had the question, is liberal arts does not literally mean art as in painting or drawing or something along those lines. They might offer those too, but it's actually not uncommon for a liberal arts college to offer engineering and science and business. They offer all sorts of different programs. So don't get too hung up on the word liberal arts. That's just a broader term. Uh, it does not necessarily mean art in the true sense. So that's category number two. Uh, number three is what we would call a community college. And just like the name would suggest, a community college uh, originally was kind of designed to support the needs of a local community. So uh, historically, most of the, the students and faculty for that matter at a community college would be from the local area. However, uh, you know, fast forward to 2021, almost 2022, um, there are many international students that attend uh, community colleges as well. Uh, but from an international student perspective, I would say most of the time when students are going to community colleges, they're doing it probably with the intention of saving money. Um, Community colleges tend to be a little bit cheaper uh, than they would uh, than, than the cost of some of the other types that you would see here. And uh, generally speaking, the intent is to get a two-year degree. So community colleges typically don't offer four-year bachelor's degrees. They offer something called an associate's degree, which is a two-year degree. But you can use that two-year degree to transfer into a four-year degree. So the intent is that you would spend two years at a community college and then transfer into one of these other types of institutions and finish years three to four. Now, you should, I, I emphasize the word intent because you should be very careful before you jump into a community college to make sure that whatever your particular major or your particular plan is actually is a viable one because it's not always as simple as saying, well, I'll spend two years at a community college and go directly into year three at another school. Depending on your major, and depending on the admission requirements of the college or university that you intend to transfer to, there may be certain prerequisite class requirements that your community college doesn't offer. And if that's the case, you could actually end up having to repeat those two years, meaning it would take you six years to get a bachelor's degree instead of only two years. I'm sorry, instead of only four years. 
and that would obviously defeat the whole purpose of you having done that and end up costing you more money than it would have with your original plan. So um, that's just a way of saying, make sure you check with the community college first and you check with the college or university that you intend to transfer to first to see what their transfer policy is. Many community colleges actually have transfer agreements where there is a guaranteed transfer with a specific number of colleges and universities, but not necessarily all of them. But if you ask, they should be able to tell you that pretty clearly. And the final type of institution uh, is something called a specialty school or a special focus institution. And that's what we are here at MCPHS. Um, you can probably tell that in our name, right? Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. We offer pharmacy and healthcare related programs. Uh, you know, pre-medicine, nursing, biology, pharmacy, you name it. We, anything related to the human body, that's our specialty. We don't offer computer science. We don't offer engineering. We don't offer history. We don't offer foreign languages, et cetera. We specialize in healthcare. Now, there are many other types of specialty focused institutions as well. Uh, and since I'm from Massachusetts, I pick all the ones that are in Massachusetts because these are what I know. There's a school right next to us called Mass Art, Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Again, you can hear it in the name. They are an art school. They focus on everything related to the actual arts, not the liberal arts. They don't offer pharmacy programs. They specifically offer art related programs. MIT, I know you all, you guys all know MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They, of course, focus on technology programs. They're not going to have art. They're not going to have pharmacy, right? Uh, and then Bentley uh, University is a local business school. Um, they focus on business, marketing, management, those type of programs. Uh, and again, they're not going to offer nursing, and they're not going to offer art either. They specialize in that particular area. Um, so this is just another type, uh, and, and a specialty institution might be a good fit for a student who has a pretty clear focus of what you want to do. Uh, a specialty institution tends to be a little bit more career oriented uh, than maybe the other types of institution to help you get to your particular career goal, maybe a little bit faster uh, or a little bit more smoothly than you might at another institution. So for really focused students, it tends to be a great option. But the opposite of that is true as well. If you're a student who really hasn't figured out your direction, you're debating between maybe something related to the sciences, maybe something in computer science, maybe engineering, maybe history, um, and you're kind of all over the, the map in terms of your interest, which is not a bad thing by any means. It's a good thing, actually. But a specialty focused institution might not be the right fit for you. You would probably want to go to one of the other three where you have the opportunity to more uh, explore some of your different interests. So, um, you know, good fit for focused students, maybe not so much for a good fit for students who are still figuring out what they want to do. All right, so that's just kind of you know, the, the little setting the stage of what types of schools we have. So now let's move a little bit into uh, you know, some things that I recommend looking at you know, when you are considering an American college or university. Uh, and there are many things, so these are just a few you know, kind of examples that I have. But let's start with location. Uh, you know, I, I talk to many students and I know, uh, you know, when it comes to location, uh, a lot of times, particularly students coming from, from Vietnam, oftentimes are, might be looking at where they have a relative or a family friend. And that makes perfect sense. I would probably do the same thing. But I would encourage you to look beyond just where you know somebody into the actual area and look at a few things. So first of all, you know, take a look at the actual environment that you're going to be living in over the course of the next four years. And does that, how does that fit into your personality and, and your lifestyle? Are you looking for a, a big city setting, right? So if you're from Ho Chi Minh City and that's what you've known all your life, maybe, you know, transitioning to another large city is the right choice for you because that's kind of, that's, that's you know, what, what fits you. Or maybe the opposite is true. Maybe because you've been in such a large city your whole life, maybe you want to try something the opposite. But that's a question you'll have to answer for yourself. But take a look at the environment around in each type of school. Uh, transportation, uh, you know, uh, that, that's certainly something to consider. To be very honest, the United States is a driving culture. Most people have cars. And in most locations in the United States, without a car, it tends to be hard to get around. Now, I say most, but there are cities that have very good public transportation. It tends to be relatively limited to the larger cities. Boston, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Seattle, probably Miami, maybe a few others. But it's a relatively small number of locations that actually are going to have subway systems or, or, or any sort of really good structured public transportation. Now, that may not necessarily be an important factor for all students, but something you might want to ask yourself, is that important to you depending on where you plan to go and what you plan to do outside of the classroom? which kind of leads me into the, the next point about off-campus opportunities for things like internships and social life. Uh, you know, depending on your program, uh, internships may be more or less important. Looking at my school as an example, we're a very hands-on healthcare school. If you want to be a doctor or a pharmacist, you have to do internships. You can't learn everything in a textbook. So the ability to actually get off campus to do your internships is quite important. 
Um, luckily, in a city like Boston, that tends to be relatively simple. In some other locations, it might not be. So you might have to have a car in those particular locations. So you know, just make sure that you're taking note of that uh, as you're going through you know, your, your college search process. Same thing for things like social life or community engagement. Decide for yourself how important those things are. Some of the really large universities, when it comes to social life, you can probably stick within the university campus and do everything you need to with social life. You may not even have a need to go off campus. Uh, in some smaller schools, you might. Uh, so, you know, look into the area, not just the actual campus itself. Um, cost of living is definitely going to vary greatly depending on location, right? Typically, the, the bigger cities are going to be a little bit more expensive. Boston, New York, LA, Chicago, San Francisco, the ones I, I mentioned before, um, while it's a lot of positive things about transportation and the like, um, they're gonna be a lot more expensive when it comes to day-to-day -day cost of living. You know, meals, transportation, things along those lines may be a little bit more expensive than other locations. So definitely something to keep in mind as you're discussing your budget with your family. Uh, and then finally, you know, residential accommodations, you know, that's something to think about. Um, there are many different types, uh, and I'll kind of explore some of those later on as well. Uh, but, you know, where do you want to be living? Do you, would you rather be living on the campus in the dormitories for your first year? Do you have family and friends in the area where you want to live off campus in an apartment? Uh, would you rather live in an American homestay that some college universities might offer, not all? Um, but definitely something to, to, to think about, you know, as you're exploring uh, the location. Uh, second thing I, I think to, to look at is the size of the school, and specifically I mean the size of the, the student body, student population. Uh, so personally, I define uh, you know the, the size as very simple: small, medium, large. And you can see the chart there. Under five thousand, generally considered small. Somewhere in the middle between five and fifteen thousand, like my school, probably a, a medium-sized school. And you know those larger research universities that can have anywhere between fifteen thousand and sixty thousand students, definitely going to be on the larger side. So, you know, what does that really mean for you? Um, I think a few things and maybe some more as well, but class sizes, right? So um, generally speaking, the larger the school, probably the larger the class sizes you're going to have. You may have some very large lecture hall style classes where you could have 300 students in a class. Doesn't mean that's going to be the case for every class you have, but you'll have some. Contrast that with a very small school, you'll probably have a lot smaller, more intimate class setting and are less likely to have large lecture hall style classes. You still might have one or two, uh, but probably less than you would at a larger university. Interaction with professors could also vary. Um, similar thing to class sizes, right? So, you know, at the larger schools, uh, you, you may have a little bit less interaction with professors because of the size of the classes. And they may be, not, not that they aren't approachable, but maybe you have a little bit more work for you to do uh, to actually get to interact with them. Whereas at a smaller school where you have smaller class sizes, they're probably already going to know your name and everybody that's in the classroom. So it makes that interaction a little bit easier. Uh, the community focus, you know, so what kind of a community uh, atmosphere are you looking for, right? So uh, at, a, at a really small kind of tight knit community school, you may know a good portion of the people on campus or at the very least walking around campus, you'll probably see a lot of familiar faces. At a school with 60,000 students, you obviously aren't going to quite have that same type of community atmosphere. Doesn't mean you won't have a community. You'll probably find, and I'm sure you will, your own group and your own community. Uh, but it'll be a little bit different than kind of the entire campus community where you might have that uh, at a smaller type school. Uh, and finally, you know, sports and extracurricular activities. Um, you can definitely put this in the, in the checkbox for the larger schools. Um, generally speaking, larger schools are going to have uh, more athletic programs and probably more athletic uh, and probably better athletic equipment. So if that's something that is really important to you, uh, a large school, you know, may be a good choice. Cost uh, of education. So for all the parents uh, in the audience, certainly something that I'm sure all of you are thinking about. Students, you might be as well and probably should start to as well if you haven't. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, uh, you know, in, in the U.S., uh, you know, with private versus public schools, the tuition structure uh, is that most of the time private schools like, like MCPHS will have one set tuition structure, which applies to all students. It doesn't matter if you're an American citizen or if you're not an American citizen. Our tuition is the exact same for everybody. And at most private schools, that's generally the case. Um, within a public university setting, they typically have two or actually in many cases, three different layers of tuition. So I'll use the example again of where, uh, where I graduated, the University of Massachusetts. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, so I qualified for in-state tuition. That's kind of the cheapest level of tuition, and I got that because I'm local. 
if my friends from California went to the University of Massachusetts, they'll pay a little bit higher of a, of a tuition for coming from out of state. And finally, international students would pay an even higher tier uh, as an international student tuition rate. So typically you'll have in-state, out-of-state, and international uh, within a public university. Um, on top of that, pretty much every uh, university or college in the U.S. will also have some sort of additional fees. Typically, tuition is not fully comprehensive and fully inclusive of every fee that you would pay to the university. Um, so some fees could be anything ranging from an international student fee, uh, which you know um, some schools might, might charge separately. We don't happen to. I know many who don't, but there are some who do. Um, other types of fees you might encounter could be something like a one-time orientation fee for your first year on campus, uh, possibly a technology fee or something that we call a comprehensive service fee, which is kind of a fee designed to help uh, provide access to some of the different equipment on campus that is not covered by the tuition. But typically there will be additional fees outside of the tuition costs. Those are usually are clearly listed on the university's website, so you should be able to find those pretty easily. And if for some reason you can't, just speak to an admissions officer or a financial counselor from any of the colleges or universities you're applying to, and they can walk you through that. Uh, living accommodations um, certainly will, will, the cost will vary greatly depending on where you're living. And I can't really say one is cheaper than the other because it really depends on a lot of factors. Depends on the city that you're living in, depends on the number of roommates that you have, it depends on your lifestyle, uh, and depends on what the university offers and what they require. So, you know, not all universities offer all three. So my university, as an example, we do not offer homestays. We do offer on-campus dorms, and of course, you can find off-campus apartments as well. Some might offer all three. Some might require you to live on campus. Some might not require you to live on campus. Uh, my school, we guarantee housing for first-year students, but it's not required. So if you wanted to live off campus, you could choose that. But again, the cost could really vary by a lot of factors. So as an example, you know, uh, in, in Boston, uh, if you were to rent an apartment off campus by yourself with just one person, it's going to be very expensive. The cost of a one-person apartment in, in Boston is very expensive. And, and that's going to be much more than you pay in the dorms on our campus. But the opposite could be true, too. If you rent an apartment with four or five different friends and you're sh sharing the cost of that, you actually could end up finding it being cheaper than the on-campus dormitory. So something that you'll have to really look into. And one just general piece of advice that I have from talking to so many families is when you're looking at the cost of education, make sure to calculate the full cost of your entire program. Um, make sure you factor in the scholarship for all four years and make sure you look at the tuition level for all four years. Don't just look at the first year. I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come to me and say, well, I'm choosing University X instead of University Y because they offered me $15,000 scholarship and the other school offered me $10,000. Well, sure, if you look at that by itself, 15 is higher than 10. But if you look into it more, some schools have escalating tuitions where it increases from year to year. And also some of the scholarships might only be applicable for one year. I've, I've had cases where somebody just said, oh, 15,000 is more than 10. And I looked at it and I said, well, but that's for one year. The other school is offering you $10,000 a year for four years. That's actually $40,000. Um, also, just because the scholarship is higher doesn't mean the total cost is lower. Uh, you know, the scholarship could be higher, but that school's tuition could also be higher. So make sure you really do the math. Don't just look at the first year and don't just look at the scholarships. Uh, and finally, uh, rankings is, is something that's a very highly contested topic, but one that I like to include because I know a lot of students look at it. And frankly, I don't blame them. Uh, if I was to attend a university in Vietnam, I could, I, off the top of my head, I could tell you the name of one university in the whole country. I don't, I don't know of any other university in Vietnam. So if I was wanting the starting point, I would think looking at rankings might be a good place to start, help me get introduced to what other options there are. So I understand that, but I very much caution you against relying on rankings too heavily, especially in the United States. Um, they can be a good reference point, but you should not make your decision based off of rankings, um, especially with understanding the methodology, how the rankings are actually calculated. So there are, are many different companies. You can see a few different ones here. One of the more common ones is called US News and World Report. Um, they have a variety of different rankings, and they also rank health school. You know, we're MCPHS, we're a health school. You can find on their website the methodology. They tell you exactly how the rankings are structured. It looks like this. The U.S. News best health rankings are based solely, meaning 100%, on the result of peer assessment surveys sent to deans, other administrators, or faculties. 
So that means they sent surveys to professors and that's it. That's how they did the rankings. So to me, if I'm thinking critically, I'm thinking, hmm, they didn't send any survey to students. Students' feedback wasn't taken into consideration. No hard data was taken into consideration. What about student success, their graduation rates, their employment rates? Um, what do I care if a professor on the West Coast, what they think about our school on the East Coast if they've never even been here? Um, so you know, to me, it's a very, very subjective, very biased type of a system that I don't think really for the consumer as a student really tells you a whole heck of a lot beyond, again, that reference point for finding out you know, certain initial part, but I, I really encourage you to dig much deeper than rankings when you're looking at making your final decision. All right, so let's jump into uh, kind of the, the actual application process, which I know is quite important as well. Um, you know, the application process in terms of timelines, um, there's a few different ways that you can apply. Um, now, keep in mind, not every college and university will offer all of these, but they might offer one and then they might offer more, but you have to check with each college and university. But broadly speaking, there are four different categories, something called early action and early decision, which sounds similar, but are quite different, which I'll explain. There's regular decision and there's something called rolling admissions. If you refer to this chart, that should kind of, I hope, fairly clearly let you know about the difference between early action, early decision, and regular decision. But the, the, the short and, and sweet of it is early action and early decision are both obviously early applications, as you can tell by the word early. The difference is early decision is binding, meaning you can only apply to one school, early decision. When you apply, you submit a deposit at the same time. And in essence, you're telling that school, you're my number one choice. If you accept me, I commit, I will attend your institution. If you're accepted, it's binding, you, you're, you're going. If you are denied and not accepted, typically they'll refund that deposit to you. And then of course, then you can go choose another school. But if you're accepted, it's fine. Early action, uh, has some of the similarities, but it's non-binding, meaning you can apply to as many early action schools as you want. You get all the same or most of the same benefits of applying early, uh, but you uh, do not have to make any commitment. Um, regular decision, typically the deadline for most American universities tends to be around February 1st, might vary a little bit, but February 1st is, is pretty common. And finally, rolling admission simply just means that that university does not have a particular deadline and they will process admissions on a rolling basis. So, you know, as soon as they get the application in, they'll review it and they'll issue the application of the decision probably within a couple of weeks. And they'll do that throughout the year. So again, universities could offer all of these. They could offer one of these. Um, so you will have to check with each university to figure out what they offer, but that's kind of just the definition of those different application uh, timelines. Um, I always get the question of, you know, should I apply early? What's, you know, what's the benefit of applying early? For something like early decision, you know, it's certainly a personal personal decision. You really need to be sure that that's your number one choice because, again, you're making a commitment. For something like early action, my opinion is yes, always. I mean, you know, you really have nothing to lose by applying for early action. You can apply as many as you want. It's non-binding, and you're telling the school that you're interested. Uh, you know, students who apply early typically have a little bit of a leg up in the admissions process. A university admission officer who reads applications, like myself, we want to have students who want to be here, just like you want to have a university who wants you. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's, it's human nature to, to have that. So it definitely does help to apply early. And there's some other benefits sometimes as well. You might have earlier priority for scholarship consideration. You might get to select your dormitories first. Uh, and of course, you just don't have to wait around as long to find out your decision. Uh, and finally, you know, do you have to select a major is, is a common question. Um, obviously, that will vary as well uh, with different universities, but broadly speaking, no. In most American universities, you don't have to select a major. You can oftentimes come in and undeclare or undecided and then decide that later. Now, at my university, actually, you, you do have to. We're a special focus institution, but broadly speaking, most universities and colleges, you do not have to. Application process itself. Uh, so, you know, typically there are, generally speaking, about three different types of applications something called a common application or common app for short, the coalition application, and then also each university's individual application. The common application, kind of as the name suggests, is a, an application that can be used to apply to actually 900 plus different colleges and American universities. The benefit is you only have to fill out the application once and you can send it to all 900 of those schools. I mean, I hope you're not applying to 900 schools, but theoretically you could. The coalition app is very similar, except it's only for about 150 schools. So if you add that up, that's only a little over 1,000 or about 25% of all of the American colleges and universities. 
the other 75%, you're probably going to have to fill out the individual application form for that particular college or that particular university, and that's usually found on their website. You can usually do it online. In terms of the application requirements, um, there's usually four things that are pretty consistent across almost all uh, application processes in the U.S., which are your high school transcripts. So typically three years, so grade 9, 10, and 11. Um, you might also have to submit the first semester of your grade 12 as well, depending on when you apply and depending on the school. Letter or letters of recommendation. Uh, my school, we only require one letter of recommendation, but it's very common for some schools to require two or three. So again, check with each school. Generally, a personal statement or an essay um, that might already be included on something like the common application, but there are universities that require a specific supplemental application specific to their school. So even though you might only have to fill out the common application once if you're applying to 10 schools, theoretically it's possible you might have to write 10 separate essays if those schools also require a supplemental essay. Uh, and finally, generally a school profile or report, and that's something that your counselor would usually send. That's so that we as admissions officers have a better understanding of the curriculum that you're coming from. And so we can better evaluate your candidacy for admissions based off of your profile within your high school setting. So those are typically required among all colleges and universities. Now, uh, additional items that really can vary a little bit more than those four things are things like the SAT or the ACT. More and more colleges and universities are starting to go test optional. So my school is test optional. We do not require the SAT, but there are still plenty of schools that do require that. So again, like everything I've said throughout the presentation, you do have to check with each school. Uh, English proficiency scores uh, are, are pretty much required across the board, but how you do that and for who can really greatly vary. Um, if you're an international student and you're non and English is not your native language, uh, you're going to have to demonstrate English proficiency somehow. Most of the time that's through an exam like the TOEFL or the IELTS or the Duolingo or any of the exams that we see there. But sometimes schools might accept uh, proof of English proficiency via your curriculum. So if you, you know, are coming from an IB curriculum or an AP curriculum, some schools can accept that as well. Uh, and also a bank statement. Um, if you are an international student in the US applying for a visa, you will eventually need a bank statement at some point. Um, however, some schools require it early on in the application process some schools don't require it until the time that you're ready to apply for a visa. My school, we don't need it during application, just for a visa. But there are schools that actually would require it upfront to make sure that you have the finances. And that kind of leads me into the, to the last point, you know, which is there, there's something when it comes to the finances called need blind versus need aware. And this is something basically that just means when you are, are, your candidacy is reviewed, the university will either not look at your financial situation at all and only evaluate your candidacy based off of your academic merit, or if they're need aware, that means they will look at the financial information and actually take that into consideration about accepting you or not accepting you. They might wanna to check to make sure that you actually have the finances to be able to afford the education prior to offering you a spot. So I have a couple of general tips, you know, for applying to schools in the US. And again, keep in mind, these are just a few of my own personal tips. Uh, but the biggest one is really communicate with me, not literally me, but me as in admissions officers at all of the colleges and universities. We're people. We're not robots sitting behind a desk reading applications all year long. We want to talk to students. And more so than just us wanting to talk to students, it's really to your advantage. Um, you know, as I mentioned with early applications, you know, it's human nature for the people who are on the forefront of your mind to be given a little bit of, of, of priority. If I've met you and I remember your name and when I actually pull up your application and I see, oh yeah, I remember Johnny from SSIS, we had a great conversation, um, that can oftentimes factor into the application decision. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that's gonna mean you're accepted, but if, you know, if it's a borderline case, the fact that you had met with the admissions officer can push you over the edge. Um, so you know, make sure that they remember you, make sure you stick out uh, and also get any of your questions answered at the same time. So it's really a win-win. Throughout your application, be honest and showcase your passions. And I say, you know, be honest as well, because you know, we're not generally looking for checking a bunch of boxes to say, okay, this student, you know, did uh, volleyball. This student was in Model United Nations. This student did, like, some students, I think, think that there's a formula that schools are looking for a certain number of outside of the class activities or a certain number of this or a certain number of that. Individual schools might have a couple of academic specific requirements, but most of them don't have any extracurricular requirements per se, but we do wanna know your true passions and, and genuine interests. That's something that is really of interest to us. And to that point, those type of extracurriculars, it can be in both directions. It could support and enhance your interest in a particular program, 
or it could demonstrate your diversity of interest. So using my school as an example, right? We're a science and healthcare school. If you were to you know, volunteer at a doctor's office or be the head of your school science club, that's supporting your interest in the sciences and healthcare and kind of I, I shows me a link between what you've done and what you plan to do. That looks good for a school like ours. But other schools, comprehensive universities, public universities, they might want more of a diversity of interests. So you know, having Model UN and some sports and some sciences and other things, that could re be a really positive thing. So it really depends, but both are okay as long as it's honest and your genuine interests. On the financial side, uh, you know, we talked a little about the cost of course. We haven't talked about scholarships and, and financial aid and things along those lines. Um, you know, generally speaking, there are a variety of different types of scholarships. Um, probably the most common one is an academic merit-based scholarship. So quite simply, the higher your GPA, the higher your scholarships. Um, pretty common for a good portion of schools would offer that. Some schools offer need-based scholarships. So they'll actually have an opportunity for you to demonstrate your family's financial need. They'll ask, you know, what your parents do for a living, you know, what your bank statements currently are, any sort of financial difficulties that you've had, how COVID might have impacted your family, et cetera, and possibly be able to offer uh, additional financial assistance based off of your family need. Now, by and large, the majority of, of American universities don't offer this for international students, uh, but some do, so certainly check with them. There are athletic scholarships at some schools. Um, our school doesn't happen to offer that, but some of the larger public universities might offer athletic scholarships. So if you're, you know, a, 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 you know, a star athlete in track and field or, you know, basketball or hockey or whatever, um, you might be able to apply for an athletic scholarship. <clears throat> There's also something called legacy scholarships, uh, which, you know, varies from, from institution to institution, but that basically means if you are the son or daughter of somebody who is a graduate of that university, it's possible they would offer a scholarship for you as a second generation student to attend that same university. Um, now, these are just a few different types and the way and the timeline that you apply for these is going to vary greatly across different universities. Um, in some cases, uh, it might be as simple as apply to the university and you're automatically reviewed for available scholarships at the same time. So my school, that's actually the case. You don't have to fill out a separate application form. However, that's not the case at all schools. Many schools, uh, you will have to fill out a separate application form for each type of scholarship that you're applying for. And they might offer three or four different scholarships. So if, you, if you're planning to apply to all of them, you may have to apply uh, multiple different times. Uh, and finally, there are uh, occasionally uh, external type scholarships or grants or funding that you might be able to look into as well. Now, I don't, I'm not personally quite as familiar about those in Vietnam, uh, but typically Education USA, um, which is kind of a division of the US government that promotes American education abroad, um, they might offer some small opportunity and scholarship funds that you could check into. Uh, oftentimes, local governments may do that. Again, I don't happen to know in Vietnam, but certainly something that you could check into. Private companies uh, occasionally. So I know for our school, you know, we've seen uh, private pharmaceutical and healthcare companies offer scholarships to fund students' education with the expectation that they would then go back and work for that company for a set number of years afterward to kind of help pay back uh, the, that, that kind of loan for, for their education. Uh, and finally, if you happen to be an American citizen uh, or a U.S. permanent resident, and I believe there probably are some on the, on the call today, um, you can apply for something called the FAFSA, which is the Federal Financial Aid Program here in the United States. And again, since it's federal, you do have to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, but you could qualify for grants that don't have to be paid back, um, and which are similar to a scholarship, basically, uh, or also for very low interest rate loans from the government that would be at a lower interest rate than you might get from uh, a private bank. All right, and so uh, you know, wrapping up here on the next five or ten minutes, you know, oh, like with you know, why would you might want to consider studying in the United States, you know, after all of that? Um, you know, I guess the, the first thing I would say is, uh, you know, the United States is really the most popular study abroad destination in the world. It has been for a long, long time. If you look at the chart here, you know, in two thousand we were number one, in two thousand twenty we were number one, and in both cases we still double the number of students and the percentage of students as the next closest country, which is the UK. Now, just because it's the most popular doesn't mean it's the right choice for you, but just a, a frame of reference point similar to a ranking, right? So just so you know where other students are standing. Um, but other reasons that would include the options, right? Hopefully you've gotten the sense that throughout this presentation that there are a ton of different options. There's always going to be uh, some type of university that's the right fit for almost every type of student. It's quite flexible as well. The American education system is quite flexible. I changed my major twice, actually. 
I started off uh, doing one thing and I ended up doubling major, double majoring in Chinese language and psychology of all things, uh, which actually leads me to the, that point as well, which you can double major. If you can't decide on something like I couldn't, you can choose two majors or you can choose a major and a minor. And if you're not familiar with what a minor is, you can kind of think of it like almost like half of a major, I guess is kind of a simple explanation. Um, so instead of, you know, 120 academic credits, it might be 60 credits. And so it's a kind of a little bit of an additional concentration where you don't have to do quite as much work as a full second major, but still be able to focus on another area that you want. Uh, the American education system tends to offer a, a lot of different uh, soft skills and, and more well-rounded skills to help prepare you for the real world. Not only the liberal arts colleges that I mentioned, um, research universities, specialty institutions, community colleges, all offer some similarity in this regard. Maybe liberal arts does a little bit more, um, but all of them offer some of these soft skills as well. So you're not only learning math and science, you know, if, if you're in a biology program, um, you're also learning public speaking skills and psychology and writing skills, all the things that you'll really need to be successful in the working world, because you need to know more than just the technical knowledge of your job. You need to know how to interact with people. You need to know how to communicate. You need to know how to read and write. So soft skills are something that are really important, I think, ingrained into the fabric of the American education system. Um, the degrees, by and large, are internationally recognized. I mean, anywhere in the world you go with an American degree, they tend to be recognized, not always, but more so than most other countries. Um, first country that comes to mind, I don't know why for me, is Hungary, and I don't want to pick on Hungary, it's a great country, but generally, if you're doing a, a degree from Hungary and you try to transfer that somewhere else, it may not be quite as internationally recognized. So just as an example, cultural diversity is a huge thing. My university, we have a thousand international students from 90 different countries very common for, for a lot of colleges and universities to have a similar demographic makeup where you have students from all over the world. The United States is a melting pot. You've probably heard that term before. So you'll interact with students from all over the world here. Uh, and finally, you know, we, most colleges and universities uh, tend to have pretty good uh, support systems for international students. Uh, ESL centers, uh, you know, specialized departments for immigration services to help with your visa. Um, all sorts of other you know, support services, emotional and cultural integration services, everything to make sure that your transition uh, is a smooth one. And the final thing I will say, and I'll wrap up quickly with just a quick note about our school and then take some questions and answers, is a little bit about after graduating. You know, what happens if you were looking to work in the United States? So um, we have something called CPT and OPT. And you can see what those stand for here on the screen. Uh, essentially, the short is CPT is uh, the government authorization for you to be able to get hands-on experience during your studies. If you want to do internships or some sort of volunteer experience or practical work during your studies, um, you would apply for something called CPT, and you know your school immigration office can help you to apply for this. Um, you can get up to 364 days of this, not 365. Well, actually, you can get 365. However, if you go over 364, once you hit 365, you lose the second option, which is OPT. So don't, don't do that. This is my recommendation, stick under 364. Because OPT is actually generally your work authorization after you graduate. Actually, if you look in the, the first bullet point, technically you can use it during school too, but most of the students use it after graduation because you can use CPT during your high school, uh, during your university career. So uh, all the international students in the US, no matter where you attend and no matter what your major is, you get a minimum of 12 months of work authorization included in your F1 student visa. If you happen to be a STEM major, a science, technology, engineering, or math, you may be able to qualify for an additional 24 month extension, meaning you can stay and work in the US for actually up to three years instead of one year. So something just to be aware of, I'm happy to elaborate more if anybody has any questions. That's the, the bulk of the presentation you know, for the study in the US. I just want to wrap up with a couple of quick words about our, our institution, which I don't think I've really talked about a whole lot. Um, I did mention you know, we're located in Boston and we're a healthcare school, but you know, we really are, are the, the largest and the most comprehensive healthcare institution in the United States. Um, been around for almost 200 years, and you know, we focus on everything related to the human body, ranging from the natural sciences like chemistry and biology to medical, pharmacy, nursing, dentistry, psychology. If you can think of something related to the human body, pretty good chance uh, that we offer it. Uh, and I guess the only last thing that I would say is just a quick note about our location. Uh, obviously, I've, I've mentioned Massachusetts many times throughout the presentation, uh, and I mentioned that we are in Boston. 
So one of the things you might not know about the city of Boston, in addition to kind of generally being the unofficial education capital of the U.S., just given how many different colleges and universities are here, uh, it's also the largest medical center of the United States as well. So we happen to be located in an area called the Longwood Medical and Academic Area. Um, pretty cool area for anybody looking to study science or healthcare because everything in the area is built around healthcare. So hospitals like uh, the, you know Brigham and Women's Hospital, Boston Children's Hospital, which is the number one pediatrics hospital in the nation, more and more and more and more. But basically, if you're a student wanting to do healthcare, I definitely encourage you to come check out Boston, even if it's not my school. Um, just you'll have more access to those hands-on learning opportunities just because of the large volume of healthcare facilities here in uh, in the Longwood medical area. So that's my only quick note about our school in case you happen to be interested. Um, with that said, um, I really, again, I appreciate uh, you know the, the SSIS team for, for having us today. Um, here is all of my contact information, uh, well, my, my email address, but all of the university's contact information as well. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about us, feel free to come and check out a virtual tour on our website or check out any of our social media accounts. Uh, I, I personally recommend uh, checking out our YouTube channel, this one here. Uh, you can find some great information, uh, video, walkthrough tours of the campus, interviews with faculty, interviews with students, all sorts of cool stuff. But with that said, I'll turn over to the Q&A. So I do see a few questions have already come in. Um, so thank you for those of you who have already added your questions. I'll get to those right now. But for anybody who hasn't, if you still do have any questions, uh, we've still got about 15 minutes. So please go ahead and list out any questions you have uh, in the Q&A box, and I'll go through those right now. All right. So uh, first question was, how would you recommend researching colleges based on major? Uh, that's a really good question. You know, uh, as I, I mentioned before, certainly ranking is a place that you can start with. Um, I don't think that that's, again, you know, really the, the, the best way to make your full decision, but it might not be the, a bad starting point. Um, you know, I think, you know, your college counselor is probably a, a pretty good resource as well. Um, I think, you know, generally they have quite a bit of experience working with many different colleges and universities and might have a good sense of, you know, what the individual specialty areas are. Um, beyond that, you know, if your high school happens to have any sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, software tools at your disposal for college search, like, uh, for example, I know companies like Scalpo or Maya Learning or BridgeU, I don't know what, what particular uh, provider your, your high school uses, but a lot of them do have search tools uh, that you can use to filter uh, by major. Um, and there's always Google. <laughs> I hate to be that simple, but you know, Google is not, is not a, a bad place to check out as well. Um, but keep in mind, um, depending on your major, there's probably going to be a lot of schools that offer the major and then offer and do very well with that major. So I would, I would encourage you to, to look not only at the major, but at a variety of those other factors that I mentioned as well. So in addition to your major, what do you plan to do with that major? Right. So and, and, you know, what are the hands on learning opportunities that that school offers or that the area surrounding the school offers? So it's a difficult question and does require a little bit of research. Um, but, you know, I think if you do the, the research, um, you know, you, you're likely to be able to, uh, to find quite a few different options. Uh, and again, I'm always happy to chat as well. If it happens to be something that is uh, in line with what we offer. Um, I have a question that says, are deposits required uh, for early action. No, deposits are not required for early action. I don't think ever. I think that this might be the only quick time I can say that this answer applies to every college and university in the U.S. Uh, early action does not require a deposit. And that's one of the, the really nice advantages of early action. You get a good portion of the same advantages of early decision with no deposit and no commitment. So for that reason, I say, you know, why not apply early action? Okay, let's see. We had another question. Is it possible for individuals to apply to multiple scholarships, for example, athletic and academic merit and an external source? Yeah, absolutely. It, it most certainly is. Now, again, keep in mind, it depends on whether the school offers multiple scholarships. But if they offer them, typically you can apply to most, if not all of them. Um, you know, it's a question you might need to ask the individual school. There might be certain conditions where, you know, you can only be eligible for one, depending on what the criteria of that scholarship is. But if you're eligible uh, based off of the criteria they set, typically there's no restriction on the number that you can apply for. Okay, let's see. Is it possible? Oh, wait, sorry, I already answered that one. Uh, 
can you introduce some majors that are included in MCPHS? Of course, yeah, thank you for that question, of course. Uh, I unfortunately didn't prepare a slide for it, so I can't show you them. However, um, again, I can tell you pretty much anything related to the human body. So our, our two most popular and largest programs are our Doctor of Pharmacy, which is a six-year integrated doctorate program. And you can act, despite being called the doctorate program, it's actually intended for students right out of high school. So you would start and in six years graduate with a doctorate degree in pharmacy and be able to get your license as a clinical pharmacist, uh, actually not only in the United States, but in all of North America. The license exam happens to be called the North American Pharmacy License, and it's applicable in both the US and Canada. We have a fantastic pre-med program, so uh, most universities that I know of, not all, but most don't offer pre-med as a standalone major. Oftentimes they offer biology and then they might have a pre-med track under their biology program. Because we're a specialized school, we actually do have pre-med as its own dedicated standalone major. Um, so if you're looking to go on to medical school or become something like a physician assistant, that's a great program. Uh, we have program in things like physiotherapy, uh, we're actually the oldest school of acupuncture and, and oriental medicine in the United States. We've got that. We've got psychology, nursing, medical imaging, optometry. Oh, man, I'm thinking I'm missing a few. We have 108 different programs, so I, it's hard for me to list them all off the top of my head. But I hope that kind of gives you, a, again, a representative sample. Um, I would really encourage you to check out our website or email me if you're interested more. And I can tell you all about all of the programs. But the short answer is if it's related to the human body, we probably got it. Let's see a section, uh, sorry, a question in the chat box as well. Let's see. Does submitting a good SAT score strengthen our chances, even though it might not be required? That's a great question. And actually, I appreciate that question, Ishan, because uh, I kind of glossed over that um, when I, I was on that slide, just didn't have a whole lot of time to go through all of that. So um, schools can be either generally three categories when it comes to the SAT. Either they require it, either so number one is they do require it. Number two is they don't require it, but it's optional. And number three is they don't require it and they won't accept it and they won't even look at it. So let's take number one and number three first. Number one, uh, you have to submit. So it'll either strengthen your or weaken your chances, but the other way you have to submit. Number three is even if you take it, they won't look at it. So the answer to your question is no, it won't strengthen your chances because the university won't even look at it to be equitable across all students. Now, the middle category, optional. That's actually what our school is and quite a few schools I know of are as well. And so the answer in that case, is it could strengthen your application uh, depending on your score and depending on whether or not you choose to submit it. So for those type of schools, again, like MCPHS, you can take it and then you can choose whether or not you want to submit it based off of the score. If you did as well as you expected or better than you expected, go ahead and submit it. It might be able to strengthen your chances, yes. Uh, but if you did poorly uh, or not as well as you thought and you don't want to submit it, you absolutely do not have to. Um, and I, I can't necessarily speak for all colleges and universities in this regard, but I can speak for myself. If you were to tell me your score unofficially and ask me, you know, should I submit it, yes or no, I'll give you my honest opinion. Uh, and I'll tell, you know, depending on the score, I'll say, yeah, you know what, that's a great score. Go ahead and submit. We'll take a look at it. If it's lower, I, I might say, you know what, that's probably not going to help. Not worth submitting. So I, I would be honest. I think a good portion of admission officers, if you're able to establish a personal relationship with them, would probably tell you the same. Really good question, though. Okay, so I've still got about five or six minutes. Um, you know, so if there are, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Uh, but if there are any, uh, I, again, I still got another five or six minutes. I'm happy to go through any other questions that you guys have. Uh, once again, though, uh, you know, if for some reason, um, you know, you don't have a question at the moment and you would like to contact me later, feel free to, to, to jot down my email or take a photo of, of this slide. Uh, and I'm always happy to talk, chat with any student or any parent uh, afterwards as well. Uh, I'll also just say uh, in a, in a non-COVID world, which obviously is not yet the case, but in a non-COVID world, uh, I do typically travel uh, to Vietnam a couple of times per year. And uh, I hope at some point I get a chance to come see all you guys at SSIS and, and Kelly actually get to meet you in person. <laughs> uh, obviously not happening at the moment. Uh, probably not going to happen in early 2022 either, given uh, travel uh, restrictions and, and uh, you know, safety protocols here, both in, at our school and also I know in Vietnam as well. But hopefully in the not too distant future, I'll get a chance to return to Vietnam and uh, I'll have a chance to visit you guys as well.
Okay. Well, doesn't look like there's any other questions at the moment. Uh, so I think this seems like a good stopping point. So uh, I just want to say, you know, again, thank you so much to all of you guys for spending a part of your evening with us. I hope that you found the presentation uh, informative. Uh, and again, thanks again to Kelly uh, in the counseling office. And thanks again to Croc for hosting us. So uh, have a wonderful evening, uh, a good weekend ahead. Uh, and thanks again. Bye-bye.